Well, welcome. It's our pleasure to have one of the newest members of our optical sciences family speak today, Saikat Guha. Saikat got his degree, his undergraduate degree in India from the Indian Institute of Technology, and there, like a lot of them, and his was in Kanpur. And after which he moved to MIT, where he received his master's and PhD in electrical engineering, then went to Raytheon, and um, joined us very recently. And today he's going to talk about his work in quantum computing. Saikat. Thank you very much, Arya. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I, I let me start by apologizing if, if my, my slides don't look mature enough or if there are any uh, typos, because I, I'm substituting for a speaker who canceled at the last minute. So I, these slides are from last night and today morning. Oh, it's not, okay, I know that. <laughs> anyway, so I have, um, I'm Saikat Guha, as Charlie said, I, I joined uh, last fall, and uh, I was with a company called Raytheon BBN Technologies for uh, nine years before I came here after I graduated from MIT, and I was part of a group that worked on quantum information processing uh, with uh, research surrounding optics-based and superconducting quantum information processing. My core research is in uh, mostly surrounding optical communications, its quantum limits, quantum limits of optical sensing, and photonic quantum computing. Um, this is, I, I have given some talks in the past in this uh, colloquium on optical quantum communications. I decided to talk a little bit about some of the work that we have been doing on quantum computing today. Okay? So this is my group. A couple of people should be here. Actually, four of them are here. Uh, Kaushik and Allison, both of them are in the audience, and they're both postdocs. Um, Kaushik is a theorist working on information theory. Allison is an experimentalist. She did her PhD with Jeremy O'Brien in nanophotonics. Uh, my third postdoc, Christos, he's uh, joining uh, our group in May. He's a quantum estimation theorist. And Michael and Thomas, they are PhD students uh, also here, both of them and they're working on optical imaging, and uh, Thomas is looking at uh, linear optical quantum circuits, probably closest, most closely relate, related to the topic of the talk today. Um, Zeshen Zhang, he's a professor in the uh, MSc department. He also joined exactly the same time as I did. He's a very close collaborator. He's a quantum optics experimentalist, uh, working on non-classical light generation and manipulation. We work very closely together. And I have two joint students with ECE, uh, Zuen and Nitin. Um, they are advised by Ivan and Bani Vasic. Okay, so uh, as I said, our, our team's focus is, surrounds um, all applications of photonic information processing. So wherever light gets used, either in communicating information or sensing some parameter of an object or computing or simulations, uh, we use the quantum understanding of the photon to figure out what the fundamental performance limits are for all those, perform, of all, all those applications, and then try to figure out how do you build receivers, trans, transmitters, codes, and things like that to bridge the gap between what can be done without leveraging those quantum properties of the photons. So I will talk today a little bit about quantum computing. Um, and can I get a very quick show of hands about um, on, on who, is, who has seen some quantum computing in, in some context before? Okay, that's a pretty big majority of this group. So I, I think I, 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 sh I should be fine with what material I have today, but feel free to stop me, and I would like this to be more of an interactive lecture than a traditional colloquium talk. So I will introduce some very basics of quantum computing and why should we care about quantum computing, and then uh, talk about this, this specific project, and a lot of the details are in that archive paper, which is in review right now, on a very specific way of doing quantum computing using photons, which I will, as I'll explain to you, um, if it does work, modulo, there are such certain unknowns that we still don't, uh, are not fully clear upon. It could be a very serious contender to quantum computing uh, in terms of the qubit platform. So as you probably know, there are uh, various companies working on quantum computing these days. There's IBM, Google, Microsoft, uh, there's Intel, and they're mostly all of them are focusing on this qubit technology called superconducting Josephson junctions. So they're not using photons as the bearer of quantum information. But So this is quantum computing with photons being your qubits. They are the carriers of your quantum information. So linear optical, this quantum computing using photons actually has a long history. The, the first paper uh, on this was uh, actually one of the first well-known papers in, was in 2001. It's called the, sometimes it go by, goes by the KLM paper, the nil 
Laflamme and Milburn paper, they introduced the no notion of linear optical quantum computing, where the idea was to encode the qubit using single photons and using linear optics, which are circuits built out of beam splitters and phase shifters to do your gate operations, and use single photon detectors to measure. Okay. And uh, it, after that, there has been many variations of that protocol, but it never really flew. It never really was able to compete with these other forms of quantum computing, the main reason being that those gate operations are with linear optics, they're probabilistic. So it, the number of resources you need to build a quantum circuit does not scale very well. Uh, but the topic I'm going to talk about today, this was based on a few realizations, mostly in theoretical developments in the last few years, that gives linear optical quantum computing hope, new hope if certain things work out. Okay, so let's talk about, let's start very basic and talk about a qubit. I think most of you prob have, have probably seen this. Um, so a qubit is simply a vector. It's a, it's a unit norm vector in a two-dimensional complex uh, vector space. So that green arrow that I label as psi, uh, it's a, it's a two-element vector. Alpha and beta are just the components in uh, along the direction of zero and one, which are just two orthonormal vectors uh, that that are the basis of this of this space that that psi lives in okay and as we know from basic linear algebra that i can write down psi in terms of any other orthonormal basis in that in that plane spanned by 0 and 1 so i can rotate 0 and 1 by 45 degrees and define vectors plus and minus those are the red vectors that you see there those are also at 90 degrees with each other so you can define psi with respect to that basis okay um, so that's gamma plus and delta minus. So gamma and delta are, are in the, uh, the components of psi in those directions. And since psi is unit norm, it has length one, magnitude alpha squared plus magnitude beta squared equals to one, and that should be satisfied no matter which basis I represent psi in. So that's, that's simple. Now, the, the uh, fun part about quantum mechanics is that you don't get to uh, measure that alpha and beta if I give you one copy of that psi. So I prepare psi and give it to you, what you get to do is to make a measurement in any one chosen basis of your choice. Okay? So let's say you choose to measure psi in the 0, 1 basis. As soon as you do that act of the measurement, that green arrow, that psi, is going to collapse to either the 0 line or the 1 vector line. So it's going to become 0 or become 1 as soon as you do the measurement. And it will become 0, it will collapse to 0 with probability magnitude alpha square and it will collapse to 1 with probability magnitude beta square. So if I had a single copy of psi, there's no way for me to know alpha and beta. I mean, if I had a million copies of the same psi, then I could, over time, I could build up statistics uh, of these numbers, but I don't have it from a single copy. Similar to that, if I make the measurement in this plus minus basis, psi will immediately collapse to either plus or minus with probability magnitude gamma square or magnitude delta square, respectively. Okay, so that's in the most basic form, that's called the von Neumann projective measurement, and I'm not going to go into more details of a most general form of quantum measurement. Now, I can take that psi and write alpha, and so two complex numbers whose magnitude squares add up to one can be written in the most general form in terms of two angles, theta and phi. Okay, that's, that's not hard to see. But, um, now, once you define it this way, then it's easy to see that um, all psi, so all pure states, all qubit states, can be expressed as a point on that sphere over there. Because you have a one angle theta that goes from 0 to uh, 180 degrees and one phi that goes from 0 to 360 degrees. So any point on that sphere is a qubit. Okay. So now next we define these poly matrices. Sometimes you would see in textbooks they call them x, y, and z rather than sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. Uh, but three, these three are these three matrices. And uh, their eigenvectors, so if I look at the eigenvectors of sigma x, uh, they happen to be the endpoints of the x-axis. So this is my plus state and the minus state. And the eigenstates of sigma y are these states, 0 plus i1 and 0 minus i1. And the eigenstates of sigma z are 0 and 1. So sometimes, uh, you would notice that in quantum computing books, they will say, okay, I did a measurement in the sigma z basis or the z basis. So what they are actually talking about is that you are making a measurement in the basis that are the eigenstates of sigma z. So measuring some state in the sigma z basis just means that I'm measuring in the 0, 1 basis. Okay, same with sigma x, meaning I'm measuring in the plus minus basis. Okay, so once you define these uh, poly operators, 
uh, these you can define various different types of single qubit rotation. So if I give you a psi, a vector here, you can try, you can rotate it on this block sphere, and any general rotation uh, about any of any axis can be written in this form. So this is just one example. E to the i alpha y. If you apply this operator to this vector alpha beta, it will rotate it by angle alpha. Uh, in this case alpha over uh, 2 alpha around this the y axis. So it has to be e to the i alpha over 2 to rotate it by angle alpha. Um, this is another example of a single qubit gate, the Hadamard gate, which turns the zero state into the plus state and vice versa. So it goes from the zero one basis to the plus minus basis. And so this way you can write down any unitary matrix on that two dimensional vector space is a single qubit gate. That's what we call a gate in quantum computing. So it's a, just a transformation of a single qubit. All right. Now, if I have two quantum systems, so two qubits, the most general state of two qubits can be written as a superposition of 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So if I pick any one of those states, let's say pick 0, 1, that state's meaning is that the first qubit, A qubit, is in the 0 state, and the second qubit, the B qubit, is in the 1 state. Okay. But then there are states that we can write. The only constraint that we have in a 2 qubit state is that the magnitude squares of those coefficients have to add up to 1 just like the single qubit case. But now you can see I can write down certain states like this one, 1 over root 2, 0, 0 plus 1 over root 2, 1, 1, which cannot be re-expressed as a state of a single qubit and a state of the second qubit, the B qubit. So this is an entangled state. So and this, this entanglement is, a, is, is at the heart of everything quantum. So quantum information processing relies a lot upon uh, superposition and entanglement. And this, this is a form of correlation that is much stronger than any form of classical correlation. So see what, so in an entangled state, if I give you, if two parties actually hold these two qubits, and both of them make a measurement in their qubits in the 0, 1 basis, they're going to get exactly the same answer, no matter what. Okay. Um, so anyway, so I'm going to represent this entangled state, this particular entangled state using that, that picture. And I'm going to get back to this picture many, over and over again during the talks. So those two dots, they represent the two A and the B qubits, and this line connecting them shows that they are entangled. And this line shows that they are entangled in this very specific symmetric way. This is called an EPR state, or an Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen state. It's a very famous entangled state. Okay. Um, now, uh, we talked about single qubit gates. So similar to single qubit gates, you can do two qubit gates, right? I can take a two qubit state. Now, you don't even have to think about that block sphere. If you know the basics of linear algebra, you can just think of a vector in a, in a vector space, in this four-dimensional vector space, and any unitary matrix rotates the two-qubit state in, in, in some general way. Okay? One of these two-qubit gates is called the control not gate or the control X gate. So X, if you remember from my previous slide, was this poly X gate. And if I apply the X gate on any state psi, what does it do to that? So if I multiply this with alpha beta, I'm going to get beta alpha, right? It, it, it's, it flips it. So control X gate is where I, it's, it's an action on two qubits, right? It, it's shown like that. So this is X, this is Y. So the first qubit remains the same through the action of the gate. The second qubit gets flipped if the first qubit is 1, and it, it is left alone if the first qubit is 0. So it's just a conditional gate, but then you are doing that coherently. Okay. So if, if the first qubit is zero, then the second qubit remains the same. So zero remains zero, one remains one. But if the first qubit is one, then the zero gets flipped to one, one gets flipped to zero. Okay. So let's see one simple example of preparing an entangled state. If I have this control not gate in the lab, and I'll talk about constructions in a little bit. Let's say I apply a Hadamard gate on this zero qubit, I'll get the plus state, which is the equal superposition of zero and one. And if I take another qubit in the zero state and apply this control not gate, what's going to happen is that this zero zero is going to go to zero zero, but the one zero portion over here is going to go to one one. So I'm going to get, get that entangled state, the EPR state. So it's possible to generate entanglement if I have two qubit gates. Now, the fun part is that, um, these gates that I just gave you, single qubit gates and two qubit gates, if I take a certain collection of single qubit gates and just that one two qubit gate that I gave you, this control not gate, you can put together 
an arbitrary unitary operation on any set of qubits. And this was first proven formally and shown by, by two people called Solove and Kitaev. So there is a theorem that, that shows you that um, if I need to get epsilon close in terms of approximating an n qubit unitary action on n qubits, how many of elements from a universal set of gates do I need to pick in order to get build a unitary that gets that close. It's a, like a circuit synthesis theorem. And there are many ways in which you can construct universal sets or set of gates. So this is just one example that M, T, and C naught. So M and T are just two single qubit rotations around the Y axis and the Z axis. And control naught is our control naught gate that I showed you in the previous slide. And this is what a typical quantum circuit looks like. You prepare a bunch of states in, in zero states, and then you apply single qubit and two qubit gates, and then you measure in some basis, usually in the zero one basis at the end. I'm not going to go into actual quantum algorithms, but you know, I'm, I'm, uh, some of you who have taken the quantum computing classes or have read books uh, on this, you would, uh, the, the most famous algorithm that is known uh, in quantum computing is arguably Shor's algorithm, which was originally described in the circuit model of quantum computing. Okay. So this is an algorithm that can factor numbers uh, efficiently. Um, Grover's search algorithm is probably the most well-known, the next well-known uh, algorithm. It, it can search through an unstructured database in um, square root of n time, whereas a classical search will take you order n time to look through a database. Um, Grover's algorithm has many variants. Uh, they are all search problems of some sort or the other. Uh, there are problems like uh, looking for a marked vertex in a, in a graph uh, or two marked vertices in a graph. Uh, so looking through unstructured databases, structured databases. In all of these, there are quantum speedups that are polynomial speedups. Polynomial speedups meaning the best known classical algorithm, let's say, takes uh, say order n time. The quantum algorithm might take n to the half or n to the one third time. Question? Yeah, you've got a closed fill dot and then an open dot as your two representations, is that still representing an entangled state or is that different than the two full dots that you had? So you're talking about this over yeah. here? Is that okay. The same thing as the one right no, I'm sorry about that confusion. So this is a gate and there that representing this state over there. So I'm so these two dots, I should have used a different color for that. Yeah. So these two dots they just represent the two qubits and that line that you see between them, they represent the fact that these are entangled. But this is this little this this notation with a fill dot and a cross circle that represents the control not gate. So this cross is a is this flip operation, and this little thing is the control. So that's the qubit that is controlling the knot. Okay. Any more questions? All right. So I would really encourage you to check out uh, on IBM's website. Uh, if you just Google IBM Quantum Experience, they actually have a five qubit quantum computer uh, that they actually have implemented in the IBM's, uh, in the IBM lab. Uh, we used to collaborate very closely with them on this IELPA program and YZ BBN, so they were funded by on that project. And it's, um, uh, you can actually submit jobs to that. You can create an account and you can write down a circuit. They will run it when they have time on the computer and give you the answer. So it's, it's really fun. But their gates are not accurate. So they're Hadamard gates or control not gates. The fidelity of those gates, meaning the, the accuracy of how close to that unitary they are actually implementing in the lab, is not that good. It's, in the usual, it's around the 70s or 80%. Uh, but you can still do non-trivial uh, quantum operations using those. Paul? Yeah. Talking about this anyway. So my understanding is that if, that if you pick a random unitary, that the circuit complexity should grow exponentially with the number of qubits and that the, the problems where we have good algorithms are actually somehow they have a structure to them. Exactly, uh, now exactly. Is the algorithm the only known one that gives exponential speed of shores and related algorithms? Mm -hmm. There's really only that one core. Absolutely, that's tr totally true, that's totally true. So I would say for the, ma the majority of class of quantum algorithms for which there are proven speedups, and this is totally a separate topic to get into, and all those proven speedups are still proven speedups over the best known classical algorithm for that problem, they are usually all in this polynomial improvement class. So you would see lots of papers, even today there were papers coming out in theory papers that will say, oh, the best known classical algorithm for this particular graph search problem goes as n to the 1.2, and we have this quantum algorithm that could do it in n to the 1 over 3. So. It, but those polynomial speedups can be pretty significant when n is large. Um, 
but you are you're totally right. Shore and everything that Shore relied on, including discrete log, uh, they have this exponential speed up speech feature. But again, the caveat being that factoring, interestingly, is one of those problems where it is not, I mean, if there were an efficient classical algorithm for factoring, it will actually not surprise complexity theorists to be, it's an interesting point, that there is none known, but it will not have serious consequences to what are called polynomial hierarchies of complexity classes. Um, that's not suggesting that Shor's algorithm is not powerful, but it it's just happens to be so. Anyway, so that's all I'm going to say about quantum computing in the circuit model. That's the most well-known model of quantum computing. But there is this other model of quantum computing called the cluster model of quantum computing. Okay. So any circuit model description of a quantum circuit can be translated to what is known as the cluster state model, where what you do is that you start with, so now going back to that picture I had with these two dots with a line, let's say I prepare a bunch of qubits in the plus state, the 0 plus 1 over root 2 state, and put them at nodes of a square grid graph. And then on every edge of that graph, and I, I go and make a control Z gate. So wherever I want an edge, I do a control Z gate. So with that, I will get the square grid cluster state, where now I have entanglement, but in this particular topology, the sheet of entangled qubits. If you can go get this as a resource, let's say you can buy this cluster state as a resource, then all you need in order to implement any quantum circuit is just a sequence of single node, single qubit measurements on that cluster where every subsequent measurement's choice is driven by the measurement outcome on your previous measurement. Okay, so all you're doing is you're just going and measuring one qubit at a time in different single qubit measurement basis and uh, your choice of that next measurement is driven by what measurement outcome you got. It's a very, very powerful and elegant theory that was developed by Rausendorf and Briegel in that 2001 paper. And again, there are many variants to that, but uh, this, I'm not going to describe this whole figure completely, but what you see here is that these qubits were prepared in the square grid graph. And uh, what this figure is showing is that this is actually equivalent to that three qubit circuit I had drawn in the previous slide. But these three yellow bands are the three logical qubits on which computation is evolving. And these are the uh, the quantum, the entangling gates, the C naught gates that you are seeing here. So the actual number of qubits I'm consuming over there from that cluster is much larger than the number of qubits I'm operating on. And this line is your is the computational depth, and that's the logical the number of qubits. So, um, uh, so that's so there, and there's a very very specific way in which I can map a circuit like this to to a set of operations on this cluster. Okay, so we are going to talk about for uh, Kaushik. Yeah, go ahead. Is there always an overhead in terms of the number of uh, qubits you need in the cluster state, or is, is it in this case that you're just uh, because you're implementing some error correction codes? Uh, that's right. So there is a there is an overhead, but the error correction adds to that overhead. So the error correction adds to that overhead, and what is that's uh, actually a very, uh, it's a good question because one, one thing that is not known is if the overhead that you add by error correction, if, that, if that's a constant overhead, okay, meaning if I have n qubits, do I need a certain fixed number times n number of actual physical qubits to, to do a quantum circuit on n logical qubits? So there was a paper very recently by, uh, by Daniel Gottesman that showed that constant overhead fault tolerant quantum computing is in principle possible. It was not known until then. Even things like surface codes, they have a log n overhead. So the overhead itself grows with n, but logarithmically with n. Okay, so let's talk about linear optical, Paul. Going back to that. Sure, sure. Because I've always found that confusing. It is true, right, that for that the number of qubits you need also grows with circuit depth. Every time you take another step in the computation, you need another row of qubits. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's the circuit depth. In fact, there are people who I know, uh, quantum complexity theorists, who look at, if I give you a circuit, like I give you a quantum circuit, it's a Shor's algorithm, uh, are there equivalent weights to trade between the depth of a circuit and the, and the number of qubits? And there are some interesting trade-offs there as well. So that could have practical consequences because you actually don't want this depth to be too, too large for photonic implementations because this is loss. You're, the more longer you wait to act on it, the more loss it goes through. So there are some interesting consequences of those trade-offs. Okay, let's talk about photons for a moment. 
see how far we can get along. So dual rail qubit, this is the most common form of qubit. This was actually introduced by that KLM paper I mentioned, the 2001 paper. You have a single photon in one out of two rails or one out of two modes. These could be spatial modes or temporal modes or polarization modes. And a photon in one mode versus the other mode defines our logical qubit. Okay? And I, that, that little arrow shows that I can always go between the spatially encoded dual rail qubit to a polarization encoded qubit by using a polarizing beam splitter. So I can have a single photon in H or V polarized could be my qubit, which is, but that is exactly equivalent to having a one photon in one out of two spatial modes. Now, uh, if let's say I start with four photons, okay, so these are single photons. They are not entangled, just one photon. Um, and then you ask yourself the question that, can I stitch together these photons? Um, probabilistic is okay, but using a linear optical circuit, a circuit that is made out of only linear optical elements, beam splitters and phase shifters and phases, so, right? Um, it is known that you can construct a Bell state, the state that I showed you previously, the 0, 0 plus 1, 1 state, with a probability of success of 3 over 16, and that assumes no additional losses inside that linear optical circuit. So if you have losses, either in your detectors or the circuit, that number goes down. Similarly, if I want to prepare a three photon, what is called a GHZ state, or a 0, 0, 0 plus 1, 1, 1 state, I'm not going to write that state, but just draw these graphs from now on, because you will, you now know what I mean when I draw a graph like this, right? Because I can, all I mean is that I have plus, 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 and I do a control Z on these two, I'll get a graph like this. The best known success probability to, to create a linear optical uh, GHZ state from six sing from single photons as a starting point on a linear optical circuit is known to be 1 over 32. Now nobody knows that if you can beat that or not. Um, this, is, this is a very constructive proof that came from I think Terry Rudolph's group that showed that you can do this and these are the circuits for creating um, the GHZ state and the Bell states. So there's a line of research where people are looking at how do you stitch together larger clusters starting from smaller clusters. In this case these you start with single photons that is no entanglement. Okay. Uh, now, let us introduce another uh, module uh, called the Bell state measurement. So just like a single qubit can be represented in two different bases, the 0, 0, 0, 1 basis and the plus minus basis, for two qubits, the, this is the computational basis, the 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So this is, this is one basis of measurement, right? So this basis simply means that I measure the first qubit in, um, in the 0, 1 basis and the second qubit also in the 0, 1 basis. Now, I can always rotate that basis to another basis, and in this case, this is a particular basis, so these four states are also orthogonal, and they all have the same amount of entanglement. They are all one ebit entangled. They all look like this Bell state that I showed you, but with different signs, and the ones and zeros flipped. But this is a valid measurement basis, because these, these are orthogonal states. But interestingly, if I use this Bell state measurement um, to me make a measurement on these two qubits, which are individually entangled with their pairs. So these are two Bell states, and I do this Bell measurement. Once I do the measurement, obviously these two qubits are gone, but these two qubits get entangled in one of these four Bell states, right? And then the, and since I'm measuring two qubits, I get a two-bit answer, right? I get a zero, one, one, zero, get two-bit answer. Depending upon what the, that two-bit answer is, this is in one of these four different Bell states. So, and since I know those two two bits, I can always translate that to whatever Bell state I desire. Okay, so now one. The, so the next question to ask is, how do I do this linear optically? Well, there was a there was a. I don't know why it started transitioning on its own. Okay, so uh, this was Norbert Lutkenhaus and Kalsamiglia. They they proved in 2001 in this paper that um, no linear optical circuit, meaning linear optics followed by photon detection, can do the Bell state measurement with a success probability that exceeds one over two. So that's the fundamental limit that you can't exceed. Uh, now, in principle, this, this Bell measurement, as I said, is a quantum, quantum measurement, so it should be doable, but with linear optics, you are limited to only doing it with success probability one half. But then more recently, it was shown that if you allow yourself to inject other states, like a Bell state or other ancilla photons into an otherwise linear optical circuit, you can boost the success probability to higher. So in this case, 75%. So this was a very, very interesting result that came from Peter Van Luke's group in 2014. That paper, Warren Grice from Oak Ridge National Lab, he showed that if I inject one Bell pair into a linear optical circuit, you can get to 75% success probability. But 
the criticism to that was that, well, that bell pair itself, you need to prepare from single photons, and you had the 3 over 16 probability of success, so overall you don't win. But Peter Van Luke's paper showed that you just need to inject unentangled single photons, so just four photons, uh, but linear optical circuit, you can get up to 75%. And in that same paper in the supplementary material that Thomas is looking at very carefully right now, they showed that the highest success probability known that you can uh, boost this to is happens to be 25 over 32, just 0 0.78. And this number is not known to be fundamental, meaning if I give you a supply of photons and you use them to boost the success probability of the Bell measurement, what is the maximum success probability is not known. Question? Eight single photons. So instead of four, they, you need eight. The question is, if I give you an unlimited number of photons, we don't know if you can go beyond that 25 or 32. Yeah, yeah, but then the one above that should be four single photons. Oh, this is four single photons? I'm sorry. Thanks for catching the typo. Yeah. Okay. So uh, now, uh, if I have the Bell measurement, I, what I did with that is that I fused two Bell states into one long Bell state. So similarly, if I'm given now, let's say, look at that example. So two Bell states. If I succeed with probability lambda, I create that long bell state. But if I fail, I have simply snipped off those two bonds and have created two single photons that are not entangled with each other. Okay. Similarly, take this example. If I take three GHZ states of each of three photons. So you see the three GHZ states, one on the top, one on the bottom, and one in the middle. And I'm doing two bell measurements that are shown by those ellipses. If both Bell measurements succeed, then I create this five photon cross topology state. Okay, this, this cross. If one of them fails, I create a GHZ state and another Bell state is left over. And if both fusions fail, then I, I'm left over with two Bell states and one photon in the middle that is not entangled to each other. And similarly, you can write down these different uh, actions of Bell measurement on as you go to larger and larger clusters. So they, if you succeed, you fuse them. If you don't succeed, you just snip them off. Okay. So let's take a step back and talk a little about uh, this idea of percolation. And then we'll go back to quantum computing and see some implications of it. So let's take a square grid. Okay. And take a square grid and visit every bond, every edge of that square grid, and toss a coin. And if the coin comes up head, you, you draw that bond. If it comes up tail, you erase that bond. And let's say that head comes up with probability p and tail with probability 1 minus p. So with probability p, a bond exists. Probability 1 minus p, a bond does not exist. And you go do that for every single bond in that square grid. And then you step back and look at the, the connected islands or connected components. And then if you plot the size of the largest connected component as a as a function of this p parameter, the tuning parameter, you see a phase transition happens at a value of p equals to 0.5. Now, this 0.5 is specific for the square grid. This number changes if you change the, 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 the uh, lattice topology. So what, what the student who did this simulation, he shows that at p equals to 0.47, that's the largest cluster. p equals to 0.53, it seems to span the whole thing. So anything beyond p equals to 0.5, the size of the largest kind of component is a constant fraction of the total size of the graph. So that size is plotted as a function of the total number of nodes uh, in the graph. So that's why it goes from 0 to 1. Okay. So this is called percolation. And you can define percolation also on sites, meaning for every site I occupy with probability q and every bond I occupy with probability p. And... Uh, then I can draw a, a similar thing I can draw, do for a site. And in that case, um, I get a region in the PQ space where I have this giant connected component. OK, so now once I have percolation, then there is a theorem from Grimmett. This is from an early probability book that shows that I can renormalize a percolated cluster. So re what is renormalization? It means that I can, if I'm above the percolation threshold, I can identify nodes in this giant connected component and connected parts that connect them such that this black thing that I'm drawing here, this is a logical cluster that is always there. Okay, You see what I'm saying? So I can always lift off a, a, a full connected square grid-like structure out of this random graph as long as it is long range connected. It's a very, very powerful theorem. And you can probably already see why this is relevant for quantum computing, because I showed you that the square grid, as long as I have that full square grid, perfect square grid, I can embed a universal quantum algorithm in it. But then under that, what actually the, in the physical layer, what exists is this randomly connected photonic state. Okay. 
So this graph just shows you the percolation region, so that square grid that I showed, that this is P, the probability of a bond being occupied, Q is the probability of a site being occupied, and uh, this region is where uh, you, you get percolation. So as I said, PC was 0.5, and QC, if you have all the bonds occupied and only the sites are being tossed and occupied, it's 0.59. That number itself is not known exactly. That by itself has been a subject of research for several decades. People are trying to just get that site percolation threshold right. Okay, so we can already put it together to see the basic idea. This was proposed by Conrad Keiling and Terry Rudolph uh, several years back. So let's say that you have these five photon clusters. So remember, we created this cluster by putting, taking three GHZ states of three photons and do, doing two fusions. And if both fusions succeed, I get one of these things. Okay? So I needed two fusions to succeed, so, so lambda square, in order to get one of these things that will become eventually a site of a graph, of this square grid graph. And now I do a fusion operation on these bonds. So if the fusion succeeds, I get a bond. If a fusion fails, I don't get the bond. So the bond success probability is lambda, and the site success probability is lambda square. But lambda is the success probability of our Bell measurement. Okay. Now, that region that I drew, this is the side bond region. So if you, in order to percolate, you need to be on that side. So I'm that, I'm that line that I'm drawing is simply this line. P, Q equals to P square is that black line that you see. And the point where it intersects with the percolation region is lambda equals to 0.825, which we don't know how to achieve using even boosted linear optics. Okay. So this will not give us a percolated cluster. But then if you pay closer attention to the creation of this five-node cluster itself, what we were doing is that we were saying, if I succeed, I get this thing. If I don't succeed, 1 minus lambda squared, I was just deleting the whole thing. But that's not the case, actually. If I don't succeed, I'm still left over with the two bell states, so you still have some connectivity left over. Now if you account for that in this picture, if both of these fail, the bonds, so these two photons are still connected and these two are still connected. And if you account for that and draw the new side bond region, you get this magenta line, which intersects with uh, that P equals to Q square line at 0.672, which is below this, uh, this threshold that we talked about, that 0.78 threshold. So this is you can get a percolated cluster if I start from these uh, uh, three photon GHZ states as a starting point and linear optical fusion. But we still need three photon GHZ states as a starting point. So the question we set out to answer in this paper, and it looks like I won't have the time to get into the actual details of the construction, but I think you should be able to now appreciate the question itself. So we are asking ourselves that if I start with a source that gives me a supply of n photon clusters at the starting point. So if n equals to 1, I have single photons. If n equals to 2, I have bell states. If n equals to 3, I have GHZ states and so on. And I have an arbitrary linear optical circuit I can use to fuse them in whatever way I want. And these detectors you see are the detectors of the fusion circuits that I push to the right. So the whole thing, the way it looks is that if you meet the percolation condition, these little clusters go through this linear optical circuit you get some mess out here, you measure a part of these modes, and you are always guaranteed, no matter what detector outcomes are produced, that the leftover modes are in this giant mess, but they are long range connected. So the detector outcomes simply tell you which bonds are actually there and which bonds are missing. But the percolation condition tells you that this is always long range connected. And once you have that, then you renormalize because you know which bonds are there and which are not there. You renormalize it, and these little block that I'm showing, this is one dot in the renormalized lattice. You get that good square grid on which you do quantum computing. So, Paul? What happens if your detectors fail or are noisy or fall yes. apart very quickly? No, so that is the good, a good question. So you can, you can include all of that in your lambda. So the question that you asked is, what happens if there are detector losses, right? So those are actually the easiest thing to account for. Um, but there are some challenges that I'll mention. Detector losses is a multiplier to your success probability for your Bell state measurement. Now, if that success probability is still within the percolation threshold, you're good. And in fact, the best known achievable success probability is 0.78. And uh, we can percolate with 0.58. So there is a, quite a bit of a cushion in terms of losses. And we showed some numbers in this paper. The thing that is harder to deal with is losses 
after the fact, meaning once I have detected them, these photons that come out, they go through losses. So this goes back to your question about this depth of the circuit. And that is an active topic of research right now that Terry Rolf uh, and us, we are also looking at that problem, is that this renormalization step, instead of carving out a single photon in this little block to be your logical qubit in that, that map that on which you will embed quantum computing, you carve out a logical block of qubits, something like the Rausendorf lattice, that can do fault-tolerant quantum computing. So that way, what you have that you have some amount of loss tolerance even in these photons. But how much you can tolerate, what is the best topology to put them together, a lot of these questions are unanswered. What are the best codes to do so? But this is a very interesting philosophy of coding where you just create this random mess all as long as you keep track of your detection efficiencies, your linear optical losses, and your storage losses once these photons come out. Uh, you don't need actually storage. The photon come out and you measure them. So if you have a small depth, all you see on the table is that you have a source, linear optical circuit, measurement. Your quantum computing is done with, the, that, that is the whole quantum computing stack. But the main challenge is to do error correction for things like mode mismatch, single photon losses, detector dark clicks is another bad thing. That's very hard to correct for. So there's, there are quite a, quite a few challenges. But this ballistic fashion of quantum computing using linear optics is a new realization which, uh, which, has a, which could have a big consequences on using photons for quantum computing. So anyway, so the two examples you have seen so far, they show that if I start with five photon clusters, so this is those clusters I put at the middle of a, every node on a square grid, and if my bond succeeded with 0.5 probability, I have percolation. The second example you see was that if I start with three photon GHZ states, and my fusion succeed with probability this much, then I can, do per, I can percolate. So the general question we ask is, what is lambda CN? Meaning, if I start with n photon clusters, what is the minimum success probability that you need your Bell measurement to succeed with, such that with the best possible way of fusing these clusters in space and time, that you can create a long-range connected cluster? So it's a, it's, a very, it's, a, it's a mathematical question that involves a lot of things. Uh, choosing that graph topology, choosing the way you connect them, and so forth. And uh, the best results that we report in this paper is this bound. We believe that lambda CN is just 1 over n minus 1. So meaning if I start with two photon clusters, clearly I can't, I can't percolate uh, because I cannot connect two photon clusters using, using Bell measurements and create something bigger. I need to th have three or larger. But with three, as long as your Bell measurements succeed with probability little, little around 0.6, you can create a long-range connected cluster, which is good for quantum computing. And there is quite a bit of cushion between this and what can be done, so you can account for detector losses. But accounting for losses in the photons that come out, you need error correction. Now, the thing that we realized is that this new form of percolation can be reinterpreted as standard bond percolation, but in a different graph. So here's an interesting thing. So this is the construction I was showing you. So I'm putting these three photon GHZ states on three of them on every node, and then put, doing two fusions here and one big fusion here, right? Now, once the fusions are done, these photons are gone, and these photons are gone. So the only one that survives is that middle one. Okay, so in each one of these nodes, only this middle photon survive. So let me draw red dots for them, which have degree two, and black dots that have degree three. So these black dots will be gone after I do the, all the Bell measurements. And every fusion can be interpreted as a success of a bond on this new logical graph. And when you do the bond percolation simulation on this logical graph, you retrieve that same number 0.67. So this was a reinterpretation of some of the older results that led us to find new constructions. So this was an open problem that was left by uh, Terry Rudolph and uh, Dan Brown and some collaborators that, uh, which, that could have an experimental significance that can you do create a percolated lattice only using a two-dimensional graph, okay? So if you were to do this on a, on a nanophotonic chip, you would ideally want something that, that is a, you know, just a two-dimensional circuit. You don't want a three-dimensional circuit that gets harder. Um, so the student who worked with me on this, and he was able to find this brick work lattice. Again, same thing, you put three photon GHZ states here. One photon survives, the red one. Here, three photon GHZ states. All three are gone because they're three degree three nodes. And you can percolate this with 0.746, which is below 0.78, and hence, this answered that open challenge question that Terry left open. And then we constructed this logical lattice, uh, which is nothing hard to understand. It's just uh, this three-dimensional lattice, same thing. This red photons correspond to the ones that live here. So there are three photon GHZ states in every single node here. 
the black ones have degree 3, red ones have degree 2. So there is one photon that lives here. And once you do all the Bell measurements and all the black photons are gone and you create edges between the red photons, you get uh, what is called a diamond lattice. It is hard to see from here, but you can actually stare, stare at it for long enough. You will see that every red photon will get connected to four neighbors. So this was a reinterpretation of that 2015 PRL from Terry's group. Um, and just in terms of a single bond probability. So the, the standard bond percolation on this gives us the fusion threshold. Extending that to a four-dimensional family of these 10 3B lattices gave us a slightly lower threshold. We kept going. And then finally, we got, for this family of circuits, we got 0.5898. And we have a conjecture that we can get all the way down to uh, 0.5, which is for n equals to 3. That's 0.5. But for general n, it is 1 over n minus 1. I'll not go into it, the conjecture of proving that, but you can read the paper for more details. And when you include losses, so this is this 1 over n minus 1 threshold I was talking about for the fusion success. These are losses in the sources itself. So your single photon source. Actually, this loss was modeled by a very specific suggestion of building three photon GHZ state by David Grishoni's group, that appeared in that science article last year, uh, by using um, an MV uh, center and scattering off photons one after the other from the center to create a chain of entangled states. Uh, there could be much better or different ways of doing it. Uh, but anyhow, so the threshold obviously goes up as the losses increase. But the main message from this work was that <coughs> we may need to experimentally move away from the philosophy of perfecting that single photon source. We may need to go back on the whiteboard on um, on nonlinear quantum optics and think of novel ways of creating larger entangled states directly rather than first getting a very good quality single photon and then then thinking of what to do with it and by, by mixing them on linear optical circuits or other things. So if I had a if you had a good scheme of generating three photon GHZ states that would be really, really valuable and enable this ballistic creation of uh, of, uh, of clusters for linear optical quantum computing. So I'm not going to go through the open problems uh, in detail, but as I said, error correcting for both loss errors that happen after the creation of the cluster, as well as non-loss errors like mode mismatch in the beam splitters that go into that circuit, dark clicks of the detectors, multi-photon emission of the sources, uh, splitting ratio errors in the individual beam splitters that go into the circuits, all of them, uh, you have to correct for them. And in our group, we are looking at a, a continuous variable extension of this idea that would use uh, squeeze states and photon detection, which we are very excited about. Uh, the reason being, s large squeeze state clusters can be created and have been experimentally demonstrated by actually two groups, Olivier Fister and Akira Furusawa's group in Japan. And what we believe, what we are working on, if that works out, what will literally happen is that you will take these giant Gaussian multi-mode squeeze states, and they have created tens of thousands of more entangled modes. You would just detect photons on them, and some of these photon detections will succeed, and some will not. And that it will not be a direct photon detection. It will be what is called a photon subtraction, which will include some form of linear optical uh, manipulation and photon detection. You will create a, a, a circuit, a, a graph state that is renormalizable to do universal quantum computing. OK, so. Uh, how long more can I take? How long questions? How long do we have for questions? Until like, what's the dead final deadline? There is, really no there is no final. Okay. I see. Okay. So let me take let me take five more minutes to talk about about one of the applications, and then I'll stop and take questions. Okay. So I talk about uh, quantum computing, and uh, this was for general purpose quantum computing. Let me talk about one of the applications that we are quite interested in is to build um, a, a network for distributing shared entanglement. Remember I talked about these bell states and connecting two bell states into one longer bell state using this bell measurement in the middle? So that's a very, very interesting, so even though it's a very simple primitive, that's a very interesting primitive to, to take small fragments of entanglement and connecting them to generate entanglement over long distances. Uh, this goes into building what are called quantum repeaters. So anyway, so the first thing, this is a uh, paper that we did, my colleague Mark Wildy and I and Masahiro Takeoka, we proved a few years ago that if you have uh, two parties, Alice and Bob, trying to generate shared entanglement over a lossy fiber of, of transmissivity eta, then uh, your, your, transmissive, your rate has to go proportional to eta. Now, our result was refined by Stefano Pirandola. He showed that actually the capacity of that entanglement generation in, in 
e bits per mode is minus log 1 minus eta. So that goes as 1.44 eta when eta is small. And eta is the transmissivity of the fiber, so that goes exponentially with the length of the fiber. So there is, so your, your generation rate or entanglement distribution rate goes exponentially with the length of the fiber. So this is really bad. So how do you get around that? You build these little quantum nodes, which are called repeaters, which is a special purpose quantum computer, a quantum processor, that can get around that. And uh, how does repeater work? So the very, very basic principle of a repeater is works this way. So, so this is one repeater node, okay, and that is Alice and this is Bob. So the repeater node creates, they have these sources. So let, let's say they're M parallel channels. Let's say these are spatial channels, or they could be spectral channels. These are entangled pairs. You generate a, a pair of entangled photons. You store this blue one locally. Send the red one out to the middle of this elementary link. So this is one nth of the total channel loss. Both sides of red photons come in. You do a bell measurement here. Some of them succeed. So let's say these two succeed and some of them don't succeed. Over here, you send back the information about which of these channels succeeded to the two closest repeater nodes. Okay. Now this repeater node receives this which both succeeded information from both sides and then connects the respective stored photon using again a Bell state measurement. Now note all of that is happening on the clock. So this guy doesn't need to wait for this guy to connect its two photons. So they're all happening on one, one, one clock. And if all of these succeed, so if all of the nodes, all the links succeeded, meaning P is the probability that one of these are successful, and is the number of channels. So this is the formula of P0 is the success probability of one of these channels, um, which given the TGW, the bound that we proved for the overall channel, this now applied to the individual links gives you that rate for the individual channels. And Q is the success probability of a fusion at a repeater node. And when you take this, this is the final rate. If all of these succeed, then Alice and Bob get one EBIT. So it sounds like there's a lot of things we are relying upon to give Alice and Bob one EBIT. But interestingly, when you do the math, and again, I'm not going to go to the details. So this is the paper, again, I'll point to. Same student, Mihir Panth, he did this paper with me. Uh, um, you get, this is the repeaterless bound, and the envelope of this particular repeater scheme, it can beat it. Your rate still goes as eta to be a number, but that number is smaller than one. So you still have an exponential decay with length, but it is a gentler exponent. And these individual plots are correspond to using a certain number of repeaters. So at every distance between Alice and Bob, there is an optimal number of repeaters you need to use. If you use more, you hurt yourself, because each, each repeater don't add probabilistic operations. So there is an optimal number, and that envelope, you can prove it. It comes out that way. Now the question we asked ourselves is that, well, do we really need those quantum memories over here to store these qubits? What if this is, instead of being a photon, what if it's a cluster? Okay, so this goes back to the question we were talking discuss, discussion about error correction, right? What if these blue photons are actually a cluster of photons such that if every photon in that cluster goes through some amount of loss, um, you're still tolerant to the overall logical qubit being stored while this guy goes out and the classical information comes back. So you have to hold on to that logical qubit. So this is the concept behind all photonic quantum repeaters where you replace the quantum memory by photonic error correction for loss, quantum error correction for loss in the photon. And this was one paper that, that addressed that. So we took this particular idea of what is called tree codes, where let's say if this is a cluster, and this is the photon you want to protect, you attach this particular tree cluster to that. Uh, by attaching, there's a very specific meaning of how you attach it. You create this big cluster. And this logical qubit is now tolerant to some amount of loss on the individual photons. Okay, So what we did was we we worked out a way in which we could mimic that memory using these photonic cluster states. But then we did a very principled study of how do you create those photonic cluster states at every repeater node, starting all the way from single photons and using linear optical circuits. So at the end of the day, what looks like at, on these repeater chain is that every repeater node, you have a whole bunch of single photon sources generating single photons. You stitch them together using linear optics to this big cluster state. You send out two photons from two sides, and this is just one big giant cluster state that is protecting that logical information. And one, once the which channel succeeded information comes back, uh, you connect the right channels, and you get the end-to-end -end entanglement. And this is what gave us this, this rate loss curve. Okay, 
and uh, this is just a paper in preparation on a different way of all photonic repeater that improves upon the number of single photon sources that we needed. And as you see, we are still looking at what? <laughs> this is 200,000 single photon sources at every repeater node to beat that repeater less bound at about a few couple of hundred kilometers. These are huge numbers, but still these are not the best. We don't know if these are the best ways of doing error correction or best ways of writing the repeater protocols. But uh, these are the first few principal studies of designs of quantum repeaters using taking into account all sorts of inefficiencies in the, in the process chain. And finally, the one problem we are currently looking at is uh, going beyond just a line connecting Alice and Bob. So what if you have a more general network? So a repeater node this time has many quantum memory slots. These can hold qubits. But now instead of just being able to do bell measurements between two qubits, you can do bell measurements between any pair of qubits. Maybe even you can do a GHZ projection using linear optics on three qubits at a time. Okay, so these are, this is the little quantum processor you have at every node. Okay. And maybe there are now multiple, multiple Alice and Bobs in the network. Let's say Alice and Bob and then C and D, they're two pairs of users. Um, just give me one moment. Okay? Uh, and they're both trying to generate shared entanglement simultaneously over the same, same network. So every single one of these edges, they're attempting shared entanglement in every step. They succeed with some probability. But every node knows at every time step which of the bonds around it, which links succeeded. So you have local link state knowledge in, in the classical networking terminology. And what that node has to decide based on the knowledge of where these different users are as to which of the qubits should it try to connect in Bell measurements in order to supply into an entanglement at the highest possible rates. Okay? And uh, this paper I get again point to... Uh, Actually, this is in archive now, so you can, if you can search this, my name will find this paper in the archive. Uh, we have found some very interesting results where you can use the quantum version of what is called multi-path routing in classical networking to improve the rate versus loss scaling compared to what you would do if I just did naive end-to-end uh, -end repeaters along the shortest paths for each one of those parties. Uh, question? Yeah, on your previous slide, you have the little red and blue Yes. Bars. Yeah. Those are just, they were, yeah, this is the student who made this. So he wanted to, he wanted to depict like how much shared entanglement you're collecting with, with different parties. I, I would not worry about that. <laughs> so you're there, you just have, you're thinking about shared entanglement as a resource. So say you have in a, in a future quantum internet, you have multiple parties generating shared entanglement and you are maybe using that entanglement for some, some application. It could be a distributed quantum computing, it could be distributed sensing, or maybe just generating quantum secured keys. So once you are, you, you're done with your entanglement, you need to regenerate entanglement. You will employ that quantum repeater network to replenish your shared entanglement with whichever party you want to do that communication protocol with. So uh, there's a lot of work in the classical networking domain on uh, routing uh, flows and how routers should act in order to supply different users with, uh, with the highest possible rate region. And we are looking at a similar extension of that theory to, to quantum networks. Okay, so I th think I'm done. So I, talked, I started with talking about quantum computing, uh, talked about a little bit about this new way of doing co quantum computing using photons, which I'm very excited about. It's called ballistic generation of clusters. It's a, it's a one-way quantum computing scheme. It, and, and this is actually truly one way. There is no feed forward, feedback. Generate photon clusters, linear optics, measure them, and that's your quantum computing. But there are many challenges that need to be overcome in order to make that happen. I'm very excited about the continuous variable version of that, if we can make that work. And then one application of that that I talked about of optical quantum computing is to build all photonic quantum repeaters for long distance entanglement generation. So I'm going to stop here and take questions. Thank you. Thank you. So questions? Yes. I'm uh, trying to understand the percolation 